Well, it's a good concert. Yeah. I was looking for it to be so Everyone was really into it. Everyone was really into it. Hey, guys. Hi. Hi. Turn off your cell phone. Okay, so Eileen uh, records, uh, she's, uh, she presents like a French American media and she records it as well for the French media. Okay, perfect. Uh, so if you're okay. Bonjour. Then... Bonjour. <laughs> That's all I know. It will be on Foreign Startup as well. <laughs> yes, it will be up on Foreign Startup as well. Well, thanks guys. Uh, thanks for coming over. I, uh, some of you know me and I, I know some of you. So uh, good to have you back and some of you are new. So welcome. Uh, this is a cool group of uh, foreign entrepreneurs and uh, we started about a year and a half back. Uh, really interesting group, uh, we have like um, unofficially we have 2,000 members, officially we have about 1,100, 1,200 members uh, because that's hosted on, uh, on a specific meetup site. Uh, uh, they come from about 120 countries and we literally count it because we, we ask a question where do you come from. They are coming from over 120 countries. I had no idea when I started this that I'm going to be hosting, you know, startups from uh, 120 countries. But good to have you guys all here. Um, so uh, the, the essence of the, the group uh, and the meetup and the, is like, so we, uh, there are so many foreign entrepreneurs, you know, that are in Silicon Valley. And there are so many foreign startups that are actually constantly, every day, coming here in Silicon Valley. Not all of them land up at YC. YC gets over 2,000 applications, I think, or something like that. And they, you know, they pass like 80, they take 80 startups and so on. Uh, and, and, and it goes down from there, you know, 500 startups, you know, other parts of the country, tech stars and you know, whatnot. So there's, there's a, there's a, the, the demand is more than the supply out there. And so the idea was like, okay, we want to launch a platform where you guys can come. It's a very informal platform and you guys can network. Uh, you know, I've seen an interest from a lot of people to like build this into something bigger. We'll see if we can do that. Uh, but for now, it's like a cool group of people, just like you guys. And so today, uh, so we bring in speakers actually that can inspire you. That's the idea. We want to get inspired, like because we have people coming here saying like, oh, I have a visa issue. I have like a funding issue. I have a co-founder issue. I have like, you know, my development issue. And I need, you know, so all kinds of issues. So the idea is like we bring in people. I have heard stories where people are saying like I found my co-founder here, and that's common, you know. And uh, so we bring in investors, uh, we bring in uh, operational experts, uh, integration, and we bring in very very uh, inspirational speakers. Uh, so today we have one such speaker, uh, Luis. I met her recently and uh, uh, knew her recently. So I was very inspired by her story, all the way from Sweden. And I really wanna have her tell more than. Uh, than I would be able to do justice on. So, uh, if you can please have a big round of applause for uh, Lisa. Thank you so much. I love that introduction. Inspire people. It's the hardest thing you can ever do. Yeah. Uh, but I was hoping today that we could try to help each other out. So, whenever you have a question, just call it at me, or if there's anything that you want to hear more of, and we can like go from there, hopefully. Yeah. So, thank you for having me. But um, so, just to begin, so you have like a background on me. Uh, right now, I run a company named Vint. Uh, Vint is spelled mint, but with a V to, to get a good understanding. And the word basically comes from Vinton, which means greyhound in Swedish. Because when you work out with Vint, you become fast, strong, agile, competitive, everything as what a greyhound is. Essentially, Vint is a fitness company. We're Uber for personal training. So our mission in the world is to build a stronger and healthier world. And we're doing so by democratizing personal training. And Vint is my third business, so I started my first one when I was 19. I had one of the sweet deals to like get into startups before you have uh, an expensive lifestyle. Uh, the worst thing that could happen to me was moving back home to my parents, which is not so bad when you're 19. So I started an e-commerce shop, and I did that for two years. It was a subscription-based uh, stockings or grocery uh, e-commerce shop. So you could buy the most premium, well, best well-known stockings uh, on subscription. Uh, from me. So it was a one-man show, uh, but I, it was acquired two, two years later. Uh, so it was a good start into the startup industry. And one of the things that I've been coming back to uh, when thinking like how I ended up starting that business uh, is my network. Um, 
and I want to emphasize how important it is to be surrounded by other entrepreneurs and people trying to do stuff because that will definitely fire you up and uh, make it easier to have ideas and make it way easier to, to have them um, coming, coming to reality. Uh, so after that I spent three months as a co-founder to a media agency and I quickly understood that the two other founders had very strong opinions and minds uh, and that that startup was going to be a lot of work and a lot of the discussions. Uh, and during these three months I also realized that there was a gap in the Swedish market, uh, on the media market, which is that it was really, really hard to reach the, the business to business audience or the affluent targeted uh, audience. So I left the media company and uh, media agency and I started Ad Profit, which is my second business. And Ad Profit, um, Ad Profit's first product that we launched was a business business ad network to solve the problem of getting good reach that was also relatively cheap uh, towards the business business audience in Sweden uh, and Scandinavia. Uh, so I, I ran Ad Profit for five years as a CEO. It's today the largest business business media company in Scandinavia with local offices around the Nordic countries. Uh, and they do everything from uh, video to art, real time bidding uh, to uh, fixed platforms and placements to representing um, international brands such as LinkedIn, BBC, and Forbes uh, in all the Scandinavian, um, all the Scandinavian region. Um, but after this, I was so tired and drained from the media industry. I don't know, you've been in the media industry. Anyone else working with sales and media? So you know, it's draining after a while. <laughs> you can keep up, but it's, it's a lot of work and it's, um, it's, a, it's an interesting space. So after five years, I felt that either, um, it, well, to be honest, I needed to do something that was more aligned with my own personal um, passion. And I had spent all, you know, the last couple of years um, getting this business launched in four countries. Uh, our, our total reach that we could ever, ever reach was like 20 million people, because the country is like this size. <laughs> so I felt like when spending all my time at it, like pushing so hard, working my hours, um, I also felt like I wanted to do something where I could swing for the fences and do something that could scale properly. And the type of media business that I was running um, was more like a consultant business, I'd say. If you look at the type of business, it's really, really hard to make it a global, big billion dollar company. Um, so I was looking to do something with my passion. I was looking to do something that could scale globally. And that equals I wanted to do something that was product driven. So I started with the first one. I was looking into is there what, what is my number one passion? Uh, and throughout my life, I've been very active. So I do marathons and triathlons, and I enjoy crossfits. I don't know. Uh, I spend a lot of time with my workouts and a lot of money and a lot of focus. And I figured if I could do something uh, which is also maybe profitable or something that I could do full time, um, maybe I'll have more time to do my own fitness. Definitely not true. By the way, definitely not true. I've never been more out of shape in my life. But it was a good uh, beginning of the thesis. Uh, but uh, the, uh, this, the, the one thing that comes true with working with your passion is you get more energy for it. And you can leverage all the content that you're feeding, the people that you meet. You know, you have tons of different um, upsides of working with your passion. The one problem that I can find, because businesses, I think, should mostly be based on a problem that you find and that you find a solution for. Uh, and the one thing that I, uh, that I reckon is the biggest problem is that people want to get the benefits from working out, but you don't want to do the work. Uh, and I realized because people around me, they were not running, they were not doing yoga, they were not strength training, they were doing nothing. And the big difference appeared when I took them with me. So whenever I said, hey, we're going to go to the gym tomorrow morning, and we're going to go climbing on Sunday, we, we're going to go running on Thursday, people showed up and people came back and all of a sudden they were in this workout routine that was sustainable and that was the first time ever that they managed to have a sustainable workout. They tried gym memberships, fitness classes, you know, they've been on well, they had fitness trackers, whatnot, um, and nothing before had worked. So I figured once you're put in a, when, number one, when you're held accountable, when someone is waiting for you to show up, that's important, uh, when you're putting it in a, in a social setting, and also when you're given help and advice, guidance, uh, something massive happens. So I uh, started talking to my other friends that were passionate athletes, just like me, they were not certified or educated. 
and everyone had the same experience. They spent three, four hours a week teaching their friends, their coworkers, their family, their sport and workout they were really passionate about. They were not earning money, but it's very empowering to teach someone something that you know and that you're, that you're passionate about. Uh, so the next step from that, when I realized, well, we actually have an untapped supply side here that can be very powerful in getting people in, in a working, uh, sustainable workout routine. Uh, I went to the two co like two engineers in Sweden, the rock stars of the Swedish engineering world, uh, Magnus Holt and Arvid Johnson, who's my co-founders. They're funding a piece of Spotify. They built a thirty. They they you know had thirty million dollar invested in their vast company. They rolled that out in eighteen countries. They built behavioral change apps that has exploded around the world. Um, and I know that they're runners, so I went to them and. Basically, my, my advice, I don't know if anyone's looking for co-founders, but my advice was, of course, I wanted their feedback. Uh, but I did not need them in this project. And soon enough, they were so excited, they basically begged to be part of the project. Uh, so that plan works. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, we got started um, before I had found a new CEO for, for, for my previous business at Profit. So for two months I was running two businesses at the same time as the CEO. Luckily it was like the beginning of it, so that was manageable during that time. Uh, and we started building on this a year and a half ago. Um, after, due to, I, I think, you know, due to our previous track record, me and my co-founders, we uh, we had an easier time getting seed investment than most companies, especially in Scandinavia. So in October, we were approached by VCs that wanted to invest. So we launched the product in Sweden as the first market in January last year. And at the same time, we closed our first seed round of $1.8 million. Um, and after four months, the idea was always to go to the US as the second market. Again, due to we all want to build something that is big enough to take over the world uh, if we're going to do this. So after four months, we saw the first traction, we saw people getting on the platform, we saw instructors that were passionate athletes that were doing a great job and they were excited about doing it. Uh, our customers came back and they brought their friends. So after four months, I moved over and that was a year ago. Uh, and I came here, we're a small team, I hired the first uh, operational staff here, so all the marketing, PR, um, community management and so forth is here in San Francisco and our engineering team is back in Stockholm way cheaper, uh, just a better setup right now. Uh, and we launched our proper version of Vint in November. So today we have about 100 instructors here in San Francisco and um, we, uh, we have a couple of hundred uh, clients, a couple of thousand members, um, and uh, we, we see pretty strong organic growth. Uh, and again, we're keeping our focus on just getting passionate athletes on board on the supply side and customers pay $95 a month and for that they get as many hours as they want with our personal trainers. So you basically tell us a location, day and time, preferably a goal if you want to like look like Brad Pitt in Fight Club or if you want to run a marathon or if you just want to stay healthy and we send you trainers, um, the same trainers every week so you can stay in your routine. So our goal is definitely for people to keep up with their workouts and not fall out when you plateau or when, you're, when you've had a cold or um, when, you know, the dinner with your friends is more appealing. Uh, so that's where we are today. Uh, and we, uh, we are actually, we're, we're going to raise our Series A end of the year, this year. So right now we're focusing on, uh, as always with a new startup, getting, getting really, really good control over what works. So we're figuring out how can we control churn, how can, can we control retention, uh, what, what is our specific customer acquisition cost, uh, where do we find our users best? How can we set up the best corporate corporate deals and co-promotions? So these are things that we're tweaking right now to figure out uh, what works on an American market. And we had to do we had to spend a couple of months after launching just understanding that we, we can't be sweets <laughs> while we're here. So Americanizing our products has actually been a part of the work. And we spent we we're still spending time trying to figure out when I'm too Swedish. Uh, and when that can work as a charming add-on. Most of the time not. Most of the time not to be American. Um, so so there's, uh, there's been a lot of work. Um, we do have, a, thank, thankfully we have a pretty strong organic growth because buying users on the fitness market right now is really hard. We have some strong competitors 
with the deep pockets. So we need to be smart and we need to go sort of the grassroots to get the initial big following to be able to compete without burning too much money. Uh, I'm all about trying to not burn too much money on things that we don't know is working yet. Um, but that's sort of the, the initial, or that's the full story. <laughs> Okay, so um, I have a bunch of questions, but I'm not asking you guys any questions, so you guys can. Well, I'm a trainer, and that sounds like a great deal. I mean, $95, if yeah. I want to work out three, four times a week, I mean, that's a no-brainer. I was just wondering, in terms of, is the market that, is, are your objective is that you want them to work out that much, or how do you make a profit? It seems like you almost want it to be like a gym, where you want some of the members not to come for you. So number one, we're never going to be able to have 100% of our users active, like regardless. Um, I think the average gym has like 40% of their users active on a monthly basis. Uh, so we've said we cannot go under 75% active users, but then there, there definitely will be weeks where you know, you're too busy at work, or you're having a cold, or you're out traveling. So it's, it's impossible to be 100% there. For us, that is not something that we just want to keep everyone as active as possible. Our best users, our super users are, that are doing six workouts a week, we pamper them as much as we can because we're in, in the growth stage, right? So the more you work out, the more people are going to be like, hey, what have you done? You look amazing. And they're like, Vince, perfect, like the best promotion we can get. And also, if you're doing it every day, people are going to ask, like, where are you going to? Where have you been? Blah, blah, blah. And again, it's rats for marketing. So the more active our users are, the happier we are. So we are concerned to not lose too much money during this period of phase. We have to be um, cautious with how we pay our instructors. So our instructors is obviously the most important thing we have because without them we don't have service. Um, but again, going back to the story, a lot of our instructors, we have about 50% of our instructors in, in San Francisco that are professional trainers. 50% are just like me, very passionate about sport and work that I've done it our entire life. So we know how to pull up a good workout. Uh, we qualify all instructors to make sure that they know safety, teaching skills, X, Y, Z. Um, but most, like 50% of them, they do it because it's fun, because it's empowering, because they're going to go out running anyways. And if they can teach someone how to, you know, pace and how to do intervals during the same time, it's beneficial for everyone. So um, not all of our instructors are doing this as a livelihood, and that makes the model work. So due to us tapping into an untapped supply side, this model works. I don't, I would not do this model if my targeted audience as instructors were professional full-time instructors. Um, I don't think it's a good enough model for them. With that said, we have seven instructors that, that all, they've quit their full-time job to do this full-time. So obviously it's good enough pay for it, doing it full-time if you want to. Is your only monetization the monthly fee, or do you have other monetizations? No, only the monthly fee. Do you have any other plans or is this um, No, I, I'm a big fan of focus. So right now we're only focused on the monthly fee and getting that to work. But with that said, I mean, we do have big brands that already want to do marketing with us. And do want to, you know, co-promotion co deals with us. Um, uh, so there, I'm sure there's opportunities in the future if we wanted to. Um, but right now we're very focused on just getting this to work. We're, we're such a small team. So we have to like choose our battle for right now. And one other question. Uh, how yeah. do you also, uh, what do you utilize to actually draw traffic? I mean, is it, as you said, it's mostly organic, but yes. do you actually work with ad networks? Have you been in that space before? Yeah, yeah, so it's funny. Um, the one thing with paying for digital advertising or advertisement overall is that it takes a lot of your time. It's just like PR. You need to like monetize it, you need to add it, you need to change copy, you need to have a really good copywriter, have fresh photos so you can see what works. And again, we're such a small team, so we tried some and then we realized we're, we're not Superman, so doing this is costing too much money right now because we're not tweaking it enough. But on the other hand, and also we're a new brand, it sounds, it's a really good deal, again, getting unlimited personal training for 95 a month. So it, it, it does, like, a lot of the users that come in from, like, regular marketing, they're like, what's the catch? And then they spend the first week just trying to figure out, like, what is bad with the service? Instead of being happy and being like, shit, this is a great deal, they're like actively trying to find out what's bad with it. So what's been working better for us now in the beginning is uh, co-promotions. So we want to co-promote with other big fitness brands, with the, you know, there's so many like cleaning service companies, um, and, you know, food delivery companies that have healthy foods, and 
uh, doing co-promotions co with them, where they say, hey, this is a great deal, we recommend it, we, it's, it's awesome, we get users that are really happy uh, getting, getting the information about the service, and they come in with, with the, the, sort of the right mindset, or this is great, and we have better retention, and we have more users getting on board from, it doesn't cost as much, so. Co-promotions is definitely co If you don't work with Six Pack Fitness yet, but you know I can introduce you. I will. <laughs> That's a deal. <laughs> Did you partner up with Homejoy? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So our first campaign with Homejoy went out today. Yeah. So we have, so we, we found sort of strategy for our co-promotions where we start with a very small, small engagement from both parts and we see what works, if it works. If our thesis is right, that we have the same audience. Yeah. And if it works, we go on to doing more advanced, uh, more advanced stuff together. Uh, so we have the first phase of a home tour now. Our thesis is right these guys. The company's good. Yeah. 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 Good, traction yeah. good visibility, good investors, so uh, anything in partnership I think should be good. Yeah. So so far, what's been the biggest challenge with the two sided marketplace? Um, having, you know, trying to have two customers essentially and, and also second part of the question, which side of the marketplace is your number one customer? So our supply side is definitely our number one customer, uh, and we started. We always start with the new market to make sure that we have good supply. We always pay them more in the beginning to make sure that everyone's happy and they're sharing it with their friends. Their friends is obviously a great resource for us for more instructors often. Um, so getting getting instructors has been easy for us because there's no other good marketplace for it, either professional trainers or passionate athletes. So we have hundreds, uh, hundreds of instructors in San Francisco now. We have another 100 waiting to be qualified, um, and we've never done marketing towards what's, instructors. What's, what's the, what so far has been the chat, the, the habits? What's, what's been yeah, so the, the problem with the, <laughs> yeah. the two-sided marketing is, uh, because on the demand side, the hard part is just getting people in, getting people to trust us, getting the commitment, getting people to really try the service. On the supply side, uh, it, it's different challenges, uh, because, um, so how do I put this? Uh, freedom, you know, free, having having freedom under your own responsibility, it's really, really hard to build a service where you can make sure that everyone is playing according to the rules. And that's one of our, still one of the big challenges that we have to make sure that, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a pretty naive person who always thinks that everyone's doing the right thing and is honest and it, therefore, we have been burned a couple of times and then added features and securities in the system to make sure that um, the supply side is delivering what they should. Uh, and that is really, really hard to do because it is a person-to-person -person service and we're not going to be there to see what, hap what happens and we're not gonna, always going to get the details from the clients either if it's someone not acting the way it should. So that is definitely, if you're looking at the two-sided marketplace, uh, that is one of the biggest challenges that we have uh, and it's one of the challenges that sort of Airbnb is facing, that dog baking is facing, all of these two-sided marketplaces where there's an actual meeting and something to be delivered uh, that is untrackable in some sense. Yeah. Maybe yeah. like Lyft, you could have a quick rating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there's, um, there's ideas <laughs> that sort of make sense <laughs> sometimes. But yeah, because it also comes to data, how can we, yeah, but yeah. So location-based check-ins and stuff is, 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 is existing now. But it's, uh, yeah, over, overall, uh, controlling communication and how that stuff has been, has been challenging. Is, is, and it's probably going to continue to be challenging to make sure that we have the right quality of instructors. Because obviously that's our number one thing. Even if the product sucks, but you get amazing trainers, you're going to come back. Yeah. Uh, but if it's the opposite, you have an amazing app, but the trainers suck, you're, <laughs> you're not going to pay 95 a month. So the trainers is the most important for this. You can see it as a, as a tech company, but essentially we're a fitness company. Uh, we just have to constantly remember that and work with our trainers to keep high quality. Is, is there a good distribution between um, guys and girls, like on the consumer side, your user side, and the trainer side? Yeah, I think San Francisco is a bit weird in the sense that there's so many guys here. <laughs> so. A training is often like there's often more girls on a on a training yeah. service. I also think that we have a competitor that is really good in sending out sort of ballet, avant bar, toning, yoga classes. 
due to the nature of me and my co-founders and my team, I think we're more like a proper workout. We we more promote you know battle group sessions and um, do a triathlon and uh, you know push yourself in yoga, do make it a real workout. So I think our communication also has been skewed away towards guys. So we started 50-50. And at one point we had more, more girls on the demand side, but now I would say that we have more guys on the platform. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is pretty interesting. Um, and on the trainer side? And on the trainer side we also have more guys, to be honest. But not that, yeah, I'd say it's probably 65-70% right now is, is male trainers. Is that because they request it to be? Um, no, I just, th it, 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 it's also a network effect from, um, because the trainers that we bring in bring our other trainers, so if we, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I would say it's that with this good thing. I don't know. What is your website? Joinment.com. VINTV, like Victor? Exactly. VINTV. Joinment. You mentioned that you have to be less Swedish and more American. Yeah. Before, so I'm always interested in the cultural challenges. Yeah. Um, so can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So one thing that is very obvious. Um, so in Sweden, for instance, with our instructors, we'd always say, "Oh, it would be great if you had a vin shirt on on your sessions, because then people would see you." And we know that you know, it's, if it's easy to find you, you're going to have a higher rating. Da da da. And here in the U.S., when we say that, people are like, "Oh, so it's my choice. All right, I'm not going to wear it." <laughs> and here we sort of have to have like a stronger like. So you have to wear a venture, you have to da da da, and all that niceness in Sweden. And if someone were to, if you were to work with this platform, and uh, and we would set hot, hard rules, you'd be like, yeah, I don't, don't want to do it. Like it's my spare time. I don't feel like it. Whereas here in the U.S., if our uh, we've noticed that if we don't have really hard, very clearly communicated rules, people don't follow. But people actually appreciate having clearly like very specific rules because then they know oh if I'm doing this I'm doing it right and then everything's good whereas in Sweden people would be like I don't think you are I don't if I don't want to <laughs> so like it's just communication wise and how we put our copy it's very different how it triggers people and um, so that that's one of the biggest ones looking at our YouTube side <laughs> from the development side so you said Sweden is more cost effective. Mm -hmm. uh, do you use internal developers or do you actually utilize outsource? No, we have our own tech team. Uh, and to be honest, uh, I could never afford the the level of engineers that we have here ever. Uh, they're cheaper than <coughs> than really really like young uh, and yeah. It's just I don't want to say anything stupid, but it's very expensive here. And in Sweden, you, you would get very talented people that have already built stuff, that have a track record, that, um, yeah, are working really fast and really, really good for, for a third of the cost. What's, what's, what's the key metric that you're looking at at the moment that you're trying to sort of, you know, lift up? Um, us internally? Yeah. Uh, so, it's, it's a very early to say because we've only been live here in this part of like four or five months. Uh, but one of the KPIs that is, that is going to be very important is of course um, like the retention. So some sort of lifetime value will be set in the next coming 12 months. And we want to make sure that people stay with the service. That's going to be the number one thing. So even if you have a small user base but everyone's staying with you, um, that's going to count for something. And that's going to be important for our Series A. Um, and then we are looking at engagement. So if we can prove that people on on average now across all our users, people are doing eight sessions a month on average, and that's uh, very impressive if you compare it to any gym membership, any sort of boutique gym, any you know. So so if we can keep the engagement up, then we can show that uh, people are you know doing more workouts due to wins. Um, that's very very important. And then we our NPS score is really. Um, really good, and we want to keep it up to 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 keep up that organic growth. Um, and are you doing things in between the training? I imagine to so what interactions are you having with with the people who are being trained? So I'd say a lot, and it's a lot of tweaking and turning and yeah. changing copy right now. But yeah, we we are 
we of course, so everyone that signs up today, this is a new feature, you get your own fitness concierge. So before you um, start tra training with one instructor, you have a fitness concierge reaching out to say, hey, you know, what's, what's your goals? Is there anything you want to work on? What's a good location, day and time for you? And they will send you trainers or even book you to sessions uh, if, if you want them to do this. Um, so we are adding more communication rather, rather than the opposite to, uh, to help you get you sorted. So your fitness concierge is constantly going to check in. Like, how are we doing? I saw that you missed a session. What happened? Or uh, you've done this for three weeks in a row. That's awesome. Do you want to change, switch something up or do you want to keep it? Um, and then in between, of course, you get automatic emails, like retention system, drip campaigns, uh, to keep you going. So where is your location? You take them to a training room? So, uh, yeah, we have about 30, all of our spots is curated. So we have about 30 indoor locations that is curated in the city. It's res residential building gyms, it's corporate gyms, it's hotel gyms that we have partnerships with. Um, all entrance, like if you're going to go to gym, everything's included in your monthly fee. So there's never any add-ons. And then, you know, our hit sessions, running sessions, um, a lot of them are outdoors because mm -hmm. they, they're better, especially in the city, to do outdoors. Um, but you could never have a trainer come into your apartment. Um, all the spots is curated. So you can request the session to your apartment, but we're going to say, great, so walk 500 meters to the other side of the road. That's where we have a curated spot. And we're going to book you for that spot. So you could always get it very close to exactly an exact address, but if you don't have a current spot, we don't we don't send trainers. Uh, we only do it to specific locations where we know it's safe and it's good and it's it's, it's appropriate for a workout. What kind of a workout? So we have 15 different workout sports and activities. So you can do everything from dancing, boxing, um, kettlebells, strength training, Olympic lifts, uh, endurance weightlifting, everything running, hit training. Um, yoga, of course. So, an acro yoga, something we re released in the app pretty new recently. A really good core workout. I never knew. It's You're like when you fly in the air. <laughs> and swimming? Uh, no swimming yet. So, we're trying to figure that out because often if you're going to do swimming here, you, we haven't solved an entrance for indoor swimming pools. You could do open water swimming, but then you need a wetsuit. And we don't want ever. We don't want you to have to bring extra gear. Like everything we do, we have tennis in the app, but the tennis instructor has extra rackets, so you never have to bring anything extra. You should just be able to go just as you're going to the gym. Uh, and swimming is hard that way. Where like if you're gonna do open water swimming, you need, probably need a lot of gear. Um, so right now we don't offer it, and not biking either due to that reason. Hey, um, as an international entrepreneur, you're New, New, New Zealand, and we come here to do business in America. You've been here longer than me, I've been here for only a month. What, what are the key challenges being in, in coming here as an international person and raising money, doing business, working with Ameri Americans, and all the, all the stuff? What have been the key things that sort of, you've had to overcome, and how did you do it? Good question. So, where are you from? New Zealand. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know your culture that well, so I can't. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if it's the same for you, but uh, no, I, I actually came here quite a bit before because number one, we were looking at which city was the best for us. So I went here, I went to LA, I went to New York, and also I made sure to meet a lot of Swedes specifically that had moved here and started businesses here to just ask this question: What was the biggest challenge for you as a Swede here? Um, and and also since I knew that my tech team was going to be in Sweden, what's the challenge with having? you know, your team back in Sweden is a nine hour time difference, it's pretty hard. So I came, I, I felt like I came pretty well prepared and I'm really thankful for that because there is um, some significant changes and differences. Um, number one is, uh, I've never understood how important and, you know, your network is. So I felt like, well, I have a pretty good network in San Francisco. No, no, <laughs> definitely not because there's such a big difference with a network that you've built for years and a network where you come in and you try to meet as many people as possible and you're trying to find a reason to meet them again. And it's just um, not having that network makes it a lot harder to get the co-promotion cool campaigns and partnerships and uh, get the right VC meetings and uh, just be set in the right sort of, I don't know, settings. Um, so I, I have huge respect for how much, time's, how much time that's going to take. 
And it's been very, very prominent when I'm recruiting. So in Scandinavia and Europe, I would just recruit through my network. And I couldn't really do that here, which was very challenging, trying to find the right people without the network. Um, so that was one challenge. And then, of course, you do have cultural differences. So a hierarchy is way, way, it's a thing here. And in Sweden, it's not. Like, even the biggest companies, um, you would have the CEO to, like, do his week of dishes. And, <laughs> like, it's something called jante lag in Swedish. The law of jante, where, like, everyone's the same. Don't think you're better than anyone else. That's, like, how I was brought up. And it's still a very strong thing in Scandinavia. And here it's very different. Here, you want something to be very clear with the vision, be very clear with, like, driving forward, very clear setting. Even company culture, someone's like, Louise, what's our company culture? Like, we're, we're building it right now. Are you, are, are you kidding? We're four people. But no, they wanted a document to tell them, are we working on a bank holiday or not? I'm like, are you serious? This, was, this would never happen in Sweden. And um, I, I, I have this network of other Swedes, so I have to go back. Is this happening to you or is this, is, is this just crazy? It, it happens. It is a difference. So, um, I, so two learnings. Always find people that are equal to you so you can check in. Is this a cultural difference or is am I doing something wrong or you know, is this just a person who's doing something differently? Um, and number two, we're talking about it a lot like internally to just like um, so even my coworkers now they can think, oh that's a Swedish thing. Ah, get it, alright. So we're coming to that stage, also being open to ask, like, I don't get it, why are you asking this question? I haven't I don't know, how would you, how do you want me to respond? So it's a learning process, um, and you don't, so for men, most weeks, uh, these kind of things sneak up on us, because we feel like so we sort of look alike, and we sort of, we, get, we sort of talk the same way, and we've seen the Hollywood movies, and we've been to New York on vacation, so we think that we know what it is, uh, but it's actually huge differences. So, but I'd love to hear your stories later on. <laughs> From, from the first month, you experienced. Yeah, I was sure. Yeah. <laughs> what about immigration or any of these other issues? So I paid my way in. <laughs> <laughs> you got so yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, Sweden, yeah. So you, you can do an E2, like an entrepreneurial visa from Sweden. You, you pay, you pay quite a bit for the first one, but then if I ever have to send my co-founders or my tech team over, it's, it's going to be pretty cheap. And it's a fast process, a quick process for us, and we knew that this was what we needed to do. So, for us, that process was pretty easy. Although I did spend my three months here before having a visa. Like I went back on day, I, I can be here three months without a visa, and on day 89, I went back to Sweden to get my visa. So I was like on the edge. Uh, but it's good. You always have to have those stressful dates. But you were traveling, you said. You went to different cities. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Different cities. You were so, exploring. You were yeah. building the, the foundation. The that was the story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's, I uh, want to talk about a little bit about the funding issues. Uh, the, the funding. Uh, mm -hmm. So your, your investors are uh, European or American or Uh So, so far, no American. So that's the goal for now. Oh. We do have an American investor now. Our first seed round was close by Ekran and is the leading VC in Scandinavia. They were like the first institution investor in Spotify and so forth. So they took lead on our seed round and they took DN Capital with them, which is a UK based firm. And then some prominent angels, uh, founders of 24 Hour Fitness and so on and such. Uh, so that was a year ago and now uh, 500 startups, they just launched their dis distribution fund, the Distro Fund. Um, and we are the first investment that 500 is doing. Uh, now, so that that's just uh, done like a week ago, awesome. something like that. Yeah, so we're doing like a small top up just to get some more um, leverage for our Series A that's coming end of year. So you got funded 1.8 in January last year, which is about just over a year. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, so that's been pushing you guys so far, international expansion, visas, team building, yeah. yeah. sign ups, corporate partnerships. So how far is it going to stretch you? And so uh, we're doing a small top, top up now, but we're not going to do, we could go like a year, another year after the, the, the sort of C2, the C top up uh, that we're doing now. Uh, but our goal is to do a series A before that. And, and like you said, you're careful about 
Yeah, so that's also a big difference. A lot of companies here, they're like, go big or go home, and they're blasting all their money on Facebook ads because they want to get rapid growth, but then their retention is poor, they crash and burn. And um, I, I'm very cautious with not spending money until you have the data on your side that it's actually going to prove to be sustainable. Um, so we, uh, we're, we're very cautious about our monthly burn, checking like what works, and that's also why we're such a small team still. So we just want to be 100% and a bit more that we have product market fit, and also know that our customer acquisition cost is not going to be more than X dollars before we invest heavily in anything like marketing or a bigger team. What about the consumer side? What differences do you see in the Swedish consumer and the American consumer that you're trying to make? Oh, it's great here. People are used to paying for services, <laughs> and they're used to like, treat themselves with good stuff, whereas sweets are not. So this is, it's easier for us here, for sure. Uh, and Sweden, I was like, get, yeah, like a personal trainer, no, I can, like, that's not for me. I could never. And here people are like, yeah, that sounds like something I, I need. So it's, a, it's definitely a, a, a better market in terms of our products. It's so more health conscious here? Yeah. Swedes are very health conscious, uh, but it's, it's easier for people to spend money on themselves here. I, I'd say that's the biggest difference. We are the biggest consumer in society in the world, right? We love spending money here. We spend more than we earn, by the way. The average American spends a dollar and yeah, a dollar and nine cents for every dollar they earn. Makes sense. The average American also has twelve thousand dollars in debt. Yeah, yeah. That's, so we have trillions of dollars, of course, in debt. That's but then you get your credit score from having more credit cards. <laughs> so it's like a system driven by that. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. It's good for us. I have more questions if there's. Yeah, for most of the guy. That's so, it. have you been pitching for your Series A yet? No. So, okay. we're not going to do that. I need. I want a couple more weeks. So, we just got our initial data, like four or five months on the market. Then you start seeing, like, what is our, like, actual churn? What is, yeah. you know, how is people staying on the platform? Like, how many sessions do you have to do to be an engaged user? So, we just got that data in that's, like, substantial enough to do something with. So, I want to use that data, tweak the features, um, get you know marketing and product updates up that we now know is going to improve the service. So we've done manual testing for the last one two months with ideas that we have that's going to improve the service. What's, um, what's, your, what's your assumption of what the VCs who would, who would do a Series A? What's your assumption on what they expect your company to look like before they would go in? So for Series A, I mean the the, the gap from a C to Series A is huge, right? And so for a Series A, you'd, I, I'd say that you need a product market fit. You need like a, you need to be on a positive trend, where you pass the 100,000 monthly revenue sort of position. For us, that means about 1,000 paying subscribers. Um, I think yeah, it definitely plays off a trend, but you also need some hard numbers, well, like proven that you can earn money, that you have. Uh, that you are not only like getting money in, but you can keep money, yeah. uh, and that you found your 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 marketing activity, so you have a stable CAC, uh, and that you sort of have an idea of an LTV that makes sense. So you, yeah, product market fit, where you also have level. Uh, so yeah, we're, I'm pretty confident we're going to be there in a few months, uh, but I do due to yeah not giving too much of the company away either for too little money, we want to work work through sort of the product marketing. Yeah, so, so specifically for your company, you say you need about a thousand paid customers. Yeah. Very low churn. Yeah. And you're about 200 now, so you need to get from 200 to 1,000 before they would invest or during their interest in investing? I just, I just think that's sort of a minimum level. I think it's a trend. But like if you if like the hard numbers that, that I think people are talking about for a Series A is a hundred thousand monthly recurring revenue, and again you know that we take ninety five a month for a subscription, so it's not hard to count on how many subscribers we need. But I think the hundred thousand is like you see most Series A companies doing about that level as a monthly recurring revenue, unless you're like freaking Instagram never making <coughs> money, just like building amazing growth. Um, that's a different story. But something for like that type of business that we are, I think that's like a, a hitting point where we need to be, but also we need to have the trend and like the, the proof that we can continue to grow rapidly and we have an exponential curve. So they the, the want to see that consistency of growth over the year and actually see that curve happen. Yeah. 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 How do you evaluate the business? How do you evaluate the business? 
So could you be more specific? How you how you propose? So you're looking for a new font, right? What you see is a font. yeah, end of year. Okay. So how do you know how much is it really for? Um that's a good question. Uh could I no <laughs> uh, No but so the benefit we Benefit, but of course, we come with a post valuation from our previous round. Uh, we're doing uh, top up now, so we're going to get a new post valuation from this round. Uh, we have a lot of competitors coming into the space that have paved the way uh, with the, you know taking on a lot of investments. We can see how much are they worth, how many users do they have, uh, how does that play off in the market. We also have other you know industry companies that paved the way for us. Uh, such as Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, where you, you have like a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace, we can look at their evaluation and how they've like built their company. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the evaluation, if we're talking about that specific one, I think it's just industry standards that we need to look at and, and match our numbers and our progress and our growth uh, to that uh, for the specific round. And we have, uh, I mean, we have amazing investors with us from the first round. Uh, that we're working really close with, that are also helping us to like always check the market. What do we need to like do the next round properly and go into it. So how often do you report to the European investors? Um, I'd yeah. say it, it depends on what we're working on. Um, uh, I try to get my chairman on the on on, on a phone call every Monday. Uh, I've noticed that the more like if you have a discrete team. Having more calls than you think is necessary is a really, really good thing. So I have two set phone calls with my co-founders every week. And every now and then we even do like once every day just to check in if there's something happening that is substantial. I try to do that with my chairman, who's also one of, my, one of our investors. Um, but I, I send like, to, to all my investors, I send like a quarterly report. And then I try to use them as much as possible <laughs> with introductions and like data. And, does this unit economics like plan work for you? Do you have any feedback? So I try to be in contact with them quite a bit just to uh, get their knowledge for the next. And they have the knowledge of the. Yeah, well. if you, if you if you're like if you're not begging off <laughs> and trying to get their attention, sooner or later they have to give you something. So it's good. Yeah. But that's an, an important thing. Choose your investor so that yeah. you get more than money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have three, three, four questions here. I just want to ask you one thing, guys, while we are asking the questions. Uh, we really appreciate the, the speakers coming over, and uh, one little way we can give them back is actually downloading the app. Yeah. All right. So uh, while you guys are there, awesome. Yeah. So uh, while we are here, let's give 20 new downloads uh, to the app. Okay, let's go. Uh, please, uh, yeah. Uh, this said we have more network here. So uh, how did you find your first customer? Um, yeah, so, uh, I have a quick question that goes with that, which is, who is your ideal customer? Like, what is your yeah, so we're targeting young professionals. They're, they, I'm sorry for the language, but again, people want to get the benefit from working out, but they don't want to do their workout, which means young professionals, they just want to get laid, and uh, they don't have time to go to the gym, <laughs> and they want to get on Tinder, so it's easy for us when we're like, don't think about it, just show up, so like, make sure that you do your workout. It's like, oh, that works with my life. I don't have to commit to my own schedule and finding something. I just have to show up, but my life is going to be better. And so and that's definitely our, our target audience. In this city, they also, like young professionals, they earn a lot of money. So our price tag, it's, again, it's very affordable for what you get, uh, but they can pay for it without a problem. So our, our first initial users, we're, we've always been big on co-promotions. So uh, we were, for our first users, I think we got them from a juice company. So during our launch, so we, oh, yeah. So of course our launch, we did get PR and like L Magazine and TechCrunch and VentureBeat and all of these, uh, that, that attracted a lot of users, not necessarily the ones that wanted to do workouts <laughs> from TechCrunch. <laughs> <laughs> But we, we got a lot of users into the platform, and then we launched some co-promotion campaigns. So like juicing companies, like, you know, they're healthy, and talking about detox, and they gave away a free month of its unlimited uh, the subscription model. That sort of kick-started the platform then. Thank you. 
Yeah, so you can basically not do anything on our web unless you're a trainer. So instructors, they have their own uh, admin dashboard on, on the web. But as, as a user uh, to, to the service, it's everything's through the app. What's the name of the app again? Vint, B-I-N-T. Like Mint, but with a B. <laughs> oh, the app is Vint, and the yeah. website is Join Vint. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, guys, I just uh, downloaded the app. Um, and such an awesome thing I just noticed, you guys have a promotion for Mother's Day. Yes, we do. $25 for a month. Who's that? I'll go for it, I'm a mother. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking of doing it too. That's, yeah, that's a donation yeah. that goes to uh, the Pink Ribbon Foundation. Yeah, right? so if you sign up with the, the Mother's Day campaign, the 25 is going to be sent to a Pink Ribbon organization and you get uh, a full month of training for that amount. My, you, my you have to tell how many children you have? <laughs> no. Anyone can sign up. We just want uh, to no. um, My mother had like two types of cancer. The last one is breast cancer. So for Mother's Day, we, uh, we wanted to do something to drive uh, beneficial money to a pink ribbon organization. So this is our solution to like give one free month and try to lower the threshold for people to commit, which is 25. We still give something to pink ribbon. And we're going to see if we can uh, yeah, see how much money we can raise with the organization. You know, it is so important as entrepreneurs, um, I, I believe that we realize that it is it is so important to give to receive, you know, before you can receive, and it's so important to give. And at this stage, if you're able to, you know, that's that's really uh, yeah. terrible. Um, any questions? So why did you choose San Francisco? San Francisco is the third most active city in America, so if you compare it, like, yeah, the first one is um, Boulder, Colorado, and the second one is Washington, D.C. Both of these cities have harsh climates, so uh, we uh, compared, and we started in Stockholm where we had to work our way through getting partnerships with inside gyms and stuff. We can get them, it's just a lot of work, so instead of getting into the U.S. and starting to spend a lot of time, you know, doing sales work to get into gyms, we wanted to do something that was more efficient, hit the run, the ground running uh, and the weather will be one of these parameters where it's like easier to get started. Plus of course um, you know people are tech savvy, early adopters, uh, there's a lot of young people that we see as our targeted audience and we're close to the investors so for a series A and stuff we want to see them you know see trading with ventures everywhere and they're like shit this is exploding it's easier to raise money that way. Uh, and if you compare, like, you could, you know, LA would probably be a good market, but it's very, it's very big and you have to have a car. And it's number 17 if you look at the, you know, how, how active the city is. Uh, New York is placement number 23. So, so the, like, first cities that you think would be the best ones are actually not as active as this one. Um, how did you tune your business between revenue versus User growth. Uh, this this question popped up because of um, when you when you raise the concern of typically when you raise your Series A, um, there's a certain monthly recurring revenue as a norm, except if you're like breaking Instagram. Yeah. Um, uh, I feel that the uh, general thinking in Silicon Valley inclines much more towards user growth as opposed to maybe revenue. Um, what's your opinion on that, and why did you choose? sort of this more revenue configuration, and where are you in the scale? Uh, how do you balance the two? So we can, uh, yeah, so to start with the last question, I mean, we can focus on um, growth during a short period of time, but then we need to see that our users are, is, is gonna convert to like paying a full amount, because if you're not building a good enough service for you, 95 freaking dollars a month for personal training, I mean, that's, that's awesome, and if we can't even get you to commit that, we're doing something horribly wrong. So we need to be focused on revenue to make sure that we're building something that is substan like substantial, um, so that we're not like every anyone can get like if you could get free training, I mean I don't know you wouldn't sign off maybe it wouldn't be as, as I don't know. So it's different if you're like Instagram and you don't have an active cost because we're paying our instructors obviously for each workout. So we need to be revenue focused. Um, and we're trying to balance that off with like doing campaigns where maybe we don't earn as much in the beginning, but then um, we, we're, we're finding these KPIs and triggers once you've done X trainings, once you've you know met X uh, other event members, once you've seen 
X number of pictures in the bid feed, whatever it may be, then you're hooked or we're going to keep you for 12 months. So then we also know, okay, we can pay this much in customer acquisition costs, we can have you on the platform for free for this long, because then we get you to do all these things where you, all of a sudden, you, you love our service, you're going to continue paying for it. So that's how we balance sort of the, the rapid growth and getting people more into the platform and then keeping focus on revenue, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I guess it's mainly because uh, we have an active cost exactly. per user. Exactly. But, but if that wasn't the case, would you choose? Oof. Yeah, it would be a completely different service. I don't know. It's. Um, yeah, because you say, I believe this is very much based on the entrepreneur's risk appetite and the um, you know, your goals and how much growth you want. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and also it's so depending on like what product you're making. If it's something where con I think the difference is if you're if you're producing a product where the content is driven by your users, you don't have to worry about them paying because they're contributing. But if you have users that are not contributing with content, then that you need to you need to see engagement in some other way, and then revenue is an easy way to track if, if the product is actually worth something. So in one way or another, you want to see that your users is giving you something that it's worth for them to spend time with you. Excuse me, if the, if the average user use your service eight hours per month, that's twelve dollars an hour, right? So we talk. So, so your instructor is paid twelve dollars an hour? No, average pay for instructors is actually really good. And right now, our average pay for hours is forty-five dollars an hour. Oh, really? So, so how do you balance it out? Yeah, I was trying to explain it for one guy. Here. <laughs> and let's just say we're really smart and we figured it out. Oh, you did. <laughs> and we're, we're still making money with paying that. Really? Yeah. Oh, good for you. Yeah. I'll be a teacher. Yeah, we, yeah, you should apply on the website. You can apply. Say that we met. They fast track you. <laughs> Question, guys. Uh, I hope you all downloaded the app. If not, please do. I just got one or two more questions. So, um, please. Oh, and I teach running. So, download the app and come running with me. <laughs> um, scalability. Can you, can you globalize or take it across? same concept and apply it elsewhere, is it scalable? Yes, okay. yes. So I mean, just to give you a perception, like every year in the US you spend about $75 billion on fitness and workouts. And that is not buying your Nike gear, that is actual workouts that you spend money on. So it's a huge market and the market is definitely right for disruption. Uh, we know that gym cards is not working. 60% of the people that have a gym membership is actively looking for another solution because they never go. Uh, so, again, when we're tapping into an unused supply side, like passionate athletes, we're even growing the market and we're going to push it out just as what uh, Uber X uh, or Uber did with the taxi industry to grow it, to be an even bigger market and scale it city by city to, to begin with. Awesome. Um, uh, one biggest lesson that you've learned being a Swedish, Scandinavian, European, <laughs> international, foreigner, whatever we want to say that, but coming to the U.S., setting up your business, because a lot of people here um, fall into that category. They are international in some aspect. They are establishing their businesses here. One lesson? One biggest lesson that you've learned. Um, as boring as it might sound, set a strategy on how to build your network and make it feel genuine. So don't put a strategy out and like work it as an obvious project, but make sure you have a strategy down yourself on who to know, what to get, like what to get from that relationship, what to give back, and how to make it happen as fast as possible without coming off as you planned it. Um, and it's awful. I mean, we also have to realize this is how this city works. Everyone that you meet is going to think about like how they can leverage from your your relationship in the beginning. And it's a part of big cities where people are here to work and, and make it big and whatnot. But um, if you're not if you're not strategic with how to build it up, it's 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 so much harder recruiting. It's so much harder to get PR and it's so much harder to get listed in, and featured in app store and whatever you may need. And network is making life a good network makes life easier and 
you should totally respect that and have a plan for it to make it happen. I think like they say, your network is your network. Yeah, yeah right? exactly, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I would, uh, I would totally recommend um, to focus on building a solid network. Uh, I, I could have done a better job, for instance, and my life would have been easier trying to get my co-promotion campaigns and whatnot. Uh, yeah, so it's the lesson I have. Uh, I, I think I, 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 I thought that I was doing enough, but I should have done more. Well, you did well. <laughs> yeah. Did well tonight to get 20 yeah, apps done. <laughs> Hey. So guys, please, uh, Thank uh, you. guess Appreciate so, uh, uh, any questions, uh, if not, then uh, please uh, join me in a uh, great round of applause. Thank you so much. That was okay. awesome. Thank you. Um, and please send any feedback. If you start using the service, you're like, or if you don't, like, oh, I never got started, or whatever it may be. Uh, our best friends right now is the one giving us uh, user feedback. So my email address is louise, like this, at joinment.com. So if you can send me anything, like good and bad, I'll send all the karma in the world away. Okay. Awesome. Please. I would love to, if some of you can get back to her uh, on the feedback on, on the app, the program, or whatever uh, you're able to do. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Good Thank questions. You guys. Thanks. Yeah.